She's asleep again, Mr. Char, one of my students is quick to point out. Not in a mean or malicious way, but because she is concerned about her new friend who just started in my class the week before. This new friend, who I will call Gloria, is exhausted every day. In spite of this, she is inquisitive, friendly, and trying so hard to find her way in her new classroom. And did I have mentioned, she also doesn't speak any English. Gloria is the fourth new Mainer to join my second grade since the beginning of the school year. I am blessed to teach in one of the most diverse elementary schools north of Boston, so it's not a surprise to my students that Gloria doesn't speak English yet. Nearly two-thirds of them started school exactly the same way. All of them arrived eager, bright, ready to learn, but also feeling the traumatic effects of a challenging journey. You see, Gloria's family is among the more than 1,500 people who have arrived as asylum seekers in Portland in 2023 alone. Why Portland, Maine? How do asylum seekers from Ghana or the Democratic Republic of the Congo or Angola decide that Maine is their destination? Some of them may have family or friends who have settled in Portland, but many hear about Maine from others on their journey. Maine has a reputation for being a safe destination where help is available for newcomers. Today I want to talk about something I feel very strongly about. I believe that housing policy and immigration policy at the state and national level are actually educational policy. Our current immigration laws do not adequately strengthen and support immigrant families arriving in this country. And schools cannot be successful if we are not lifting up all of the families in our community. Let me talk a little bit about the journey so many of the asylees served by my school have taken. It starts with unrest in their home countries. In order to be considered as an asylum seeker, one needs to have suffered persecution or be in fear of suffering persecution for one's race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group, or political opinion. Proving this will be difficult for many with more than half being denied asylum and being sent back to their home countries. Most of the asylum seekers arriving in Portland start their journey by flying to Brazil. Due to strict visa requirements, Brazil is the closest they can get to the border of their ultimate destination. And here is where the journey becomes incredibly harrowing. They begin by traveling overland to Panama by bus or truck. The next destination is Colombia, but there is an immense obstacle in the way. The Pan American Highway stretches from Argentina to Alaska with one significant roadblock. The Darien Gap is a 66 mile stretch of jungle that must be traversed by foot. Asylum seekers pay smugglers to get them started through this jungle that is among the wettest places on earth. They will spend one to two weeks walking in the jungle, sun up to sundown, through treacherous terrain, up and down mountains, and across raging rivers. All along the way, families may see belongings that people discarded as they became too heavy to carry, and more alarmingly, the remains of travelers who were unable to make it to the border. Darien Gap is a cruel place, prone to flash floodings, it is not uncommon for children to be swept out of their parents' arms as they attempt to ford rushing rivers. And those that survive this ordeal still have so far to go to reach the U.S.-Mexico border. Asylees are allowed into the U.S. if they pass what is called a credible fear test. And then they decide where they're going to settle. Portland, Maine has a reputation for having a humane system for refugees and resettlement. Newcomers are immediately eligible for general assistance providing food and housing support, and the schools in Portland are ready to welcome their children with English language programming and systems developed over the last three decades. Like most of the rest of the state, Portland is experiencing a housing crisis. Rents are increasing exponentially. In recent years, the family shelter in Portland has been so full 
that families have been forced to sleep sitting up in chairs. Think about that. Children were going to school after spending their night sitting in a chair in a crowded room. By the summer of 2022, the situation in Portland was so acute that the Portland Expo, home of the Maine Celtics, was retrofitted to serve as a shelter for 300 asylum seekers, mostly families with children. It reopened this year in response to overwhelming need in the community, but is slated to close in August with limited options moving forward for the families that are staying there. Last year, I had a student who was sleeping at a church, students who were doubled up with other families, and students who were worried that they might have to live in their cars. And I am just one teacher in Portland. That is why I believe that housing policy and immigration policy are educational policy. There are no easy answers, but I believe that there are some obvious policy changes that can help our newcomer families get settled more quickly and securely. But they will require the cooperation of local, state, and federal governments. Currently, asylees must wait at least six months before they are allowed to work. Changing work requirements to allow new Mainers to enter the workforce more quickly would benefit families and the entire community and will allow asylees to establish roots here. There's already a system in place to issue temporary work visas that allow foreign workers to work in the US. It seems like that system could be built out to support people while they wait for their permanent work visa. In the short term, the state can help develop creative temporary housing solutions by looking at current unoccupied infrastructure like empty college dormitories or by retrofitting existing buildings to be suitable for housing. Students that have a warm and safe place to sleep at night are going to be more successful in school. In the long term, state and federal agencies can look at developing financial incentives to encourage developers to build affordable housing around population centers both in and outside of the Portland area. Strengthening support for the families of new Mainers and, in fact, all Maine families through federal and state policy reform is educational reform. In a state with an aging population, encouraging young families to settle here helps secure all of our futures. Gloria doesn't have to speak English to know that she's taken care of in school, that I will make sure that she isn't hungry, and that she has the gear she needs to play outside. Students like Gloria are ready to excel, ready to become part of a new generation of leaders. And all of that starts by ensuring that her family is okay. Thank you.